for the invitation to be here. Uh, I'll be talking about something very different now, and that is to say the disease of cancer. I'm one of the large uh, cohort of cancer researchers of whom one says more people are, are dying, are living off the disease than, than dying from it. There are many of us. Uh, just to begin, I, I would just mention the fact that um, if you look at a whole variety of different kinds of cancers, cancers develop in a multi-step process that often takes many decades uh, long to develop to, to its completion. Uh, already in 1989, Fogelstein and Kinsler and others were able to show that in the context of colorectal cancer, these changes in the histopathology of a tumor leading from fully normal tissue to a primary carcinoma um, involved and are accompanied by alterations in the genetic constitution of the cells that are involving progressively more to a state of high-grade malignancy. Uh, the same can be said, for example, in the pancreas, where once again, it's, if one, as one sees the increasing degree of histopathological abnormality, one sees the accumulation of genetic mutations, which are not simply accompanying this change, but actually driving the change. And, and the model that uh, has, has uh, uh, um, developed is that there's a whole series of pathways in a human cell that need to be deregulated. Here is one representation of this, and what one has learned is if one perturbs each of these distinct signaling pathways together, that will create a fully transformed cell, indicating that one needs multiple successive changes in a human cell, at this case in the level of genetics, in order to create a fully neoplastic, a fully uh, mal malignant uh, transformed cell. This has led in turn to a model of Darwinian evolution, where uh, one has mutation, followed by uh, selectively advantageous mutations, followed by clonal expansion, which leads to new populations of cells that sustain a second and a third and a fourth mutation, each of which confers progress, um, increased uh, proliferative advantage, and that in turn allows the clonal expansion that leads to these uh, uh, highly malignant cells. Once again, a series of four, five, six, seven changes. And these changes, this complexity of multi-step tumor genesis explains much of the overall phenomenology of human cancer because here one sees that most cancers take a very long time to develop with the exception, interestingly, of female breast cancer. But luckily, most of the defenses that are hardwired into our cells are able to act to forestall the appearance of human cancer simply because they are so complex and require multiple steps of being breached by these multiple mutations, which I indicate are accumulated in, in human uh, cells as they progress ever more closely to high-grade malignancy. So given all this, the formation going from here to a primary tumor, which we would call this carcinoma, the question is what goes on at the last stage? And does that last change, going from a primary tumor to a, a distant metastasis, actually require additional genetic mutations, and is it also a process driven by some kind of Darwinian evolution? In truth, uh, this process going from a primary cancer to metastasis is actually, it subsumes a much more complex multi-step process that's often called the invasion metastasis cascade and involves the acquisition of invasiveness by cancer cells, their invasion into and escape from the circulation, and ultimately the formation of a macroscopic metastasis. And the question is then, is this last step also fueled and driven by additional genetic mutations? And here one learns, at least in the case of carcinomas, which on their own constitute roughly 80% of human cancers. Uh, some interesting lessons from looking at tumors like this one here. Here we see a human, a human breast cancer cells, which are expressing, interestingly, an epithelial marker. By definition, uh, carcinomas all derive from epithelial tissues. And this indicates that this, these carcinoma cells express an epithelial marker, seen here in red. Outside of these implanted carcinoma cells, are host cells, indicated by their blue nuclei, which are normal host cells that are recruited into the tumor by the cancer cells in order to provide the tumor cells with various kinds of physiologic support. And of great interest to our discussion today are these green cells, because they have shut down the epithelial marker, in this case it's called cytokeratin, and instead now express a mesenchymal marker, bimentin. And this means that these cells have undergone a profound transdifferentiation, a change in cell state. Previously, they were epithelial cells, such as those that line our skin. And now they've become co connective tissue cells. And this change, which occurs massively in this tumor, seems to uh, generate an entirely new set of cell biological attributes. So here, one imagines this, uh, this conversion occurs 
on, on all of the fronts of the cancer cell and thereby engenders these profound changes in cell phenotype. Here one can see it more closely where we see a tongue of carcinoma cells expressing the epithelial marker once again. Outside are the recruited host cells. We call these the stromal cells. And what you see is that the carcinoma cells that are directly opposed to the stroma seem to have undergone this change from uh, an epithelial to mesenchymal state. And this change is often called the epithelial mesenchymal transition. And it's a cell biological program that is involved often in wound healing, as I'll show momentarily in embryogenesis. And um, it, it, can, it dows these cells, obviously being triggered by contextual signals from, uh, with a whole new set of properties. Here one sees the converse process, a tongue of carcinoma cells that have uh, instead of now expressed the mesenchymal marker uh, by Menten, which uh, the cells in the center of this tongue of carcinoma cells did not express. And this um, cell biological program uh, was uh, described first in 1986 by Betty Hay, uh, who was a chairman of cell biology uh, at Harvard Medical School or as they call themselves, the medical school in Boston, much to the distress of the other medical schools in Boston. Uh, but we won't go, go there. Um, and, when, uh, and here we see it's, it, it's a series of cell biological changes which involve more than just subtle changes in cell biological phenotype. It's a profound shift in cell biology. When my lab first started working on this epithelial mesenchymal transition, I got pushback from the developmental biologists who said, being very territorial, this is really their domain. Why am I horning in on what they're working on? And I realized only years later that I have a legal and hereditary right to work on the EMT because it turns out Elizabeth Hay was lured into the profession of biology when she was an undergraduate by my sister-in-law's father. So uh, <laughs> obviously preordained. Anyhow. so. Uh, one thing that's unexplained by what I've told you until now is the nature of the signals that are released by the stroma and impinge on the carcinoma cells to evoke the activation of this previously latent EMT program, which is normally unexpressed in the epithelial cells, but is expressed, is induced in response to these signals. Here we see uh, one manifestation of this, the work of Anne Lee. Here's a carcinoma cell, releases this signaling molecule, it's called interleukin-1, that impinges on a stromal cell a normal recruited host cell that responds in a multitude of ways, sending signals ba reciprocally back to the carcinoma cell, which then activates its previously latent EMT program, which previously had not been expressed. Here's another alternative interaction between the stromal cells and uh, the carcinoma cell. In this case, we're talking about a carcinoma cell that has already activated its EMT program, already has acquired mesenchymal characteristics, and here it recruits a host cell, a macrophage, which becomes tethered mechanically to the carcinoma cell, sends signals in that sustain the expression of the EMT program long after it's been activated, in ensuring that this carcinoma cell will dwell for a longer period of time in the mesenchymal state. The EMT program is of, of, of ancient lineage. Here we see a sea urchin embryo in which a, a blast gel is already activating the EMT program uh, in anticipation of forming the endoderm and the mesoderm. And in fact, there are a series Well, uh, uh, Gary has uh, yeah. connections with the fire department. That's nothing. Um, so uh, we, we don't talk about that. Uh, so uh, uh, what are you going to do next? Uh, so here we see a whole series of metazoa. And there are a series of transcription factors which are master regulators that orchestrate the EMT program in a whole variety of different species. All of these transcription factors, these master regulators of the EMT program are present in the genomes of all complex metazoa, indicating they were already evolved 600 million years ago before the metazoan radiation and have been highly uh, conserved in the intervening 600 million years. Here I'm shifting gears momentarily to indicate the work of Michael Clark and Muhammad Al-Hajj, who were interested in the biology of breast cancer cells. And here they took a, a human breast cancer and they fractionated individual cells in the breast cancer into two classes using fluorescence activated cell sorting. Here was a minority of cells and as few as 200 of these when implanted in a mouse already was sufficient to trigger the outgrowth of a new tumor. Conversely, here was a majority of population of cells and these cells lacked this tumor-initiating capability. 
So these cells could reside in at least two alternative phenotypic states, the same as cells could reside alternatively in an epithelial and mesenchymal state. And uh, what, what one came to mind was a hierarchical model like this, which had been previously embraced by those studying normal epithelial physiology, in which at the apex here, one has a self-renewing stem cell that is able to divide and generate copies of itself, but generate a majority population which lacks this stem-like quality. And given that, um, this, was, uh, this uh, was used and invoked to, uh, uh, to, to see how uh, cancer cells would behave in similar fashion. And here we see a, 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 position, a, a fax analysis, majority population of uh, non-stem cells, uh, m minority population of stem cells in a slightly different fax analysis. And uh, what Sender Raimani and uh, uh, <clears throat> Mai Jing Liao did in my laboratory was to ask the following question. Is there any connection between the EMT program I told you before about and uh, the stem cell program, which I've just described? And what they found was when they took these non-stem cells and they forced them to go through an EMT, changing their morphology and monolayer culture, all of the non-stem cells migrated en masse from the non-stem cell into the stem cell position, providing the initial indication that the EMT program is a very important route by which epithelial cells can enter into the stem cell state. Indeed, naturally present epithelial stem cells express a whole series of mesenchymal markers indicative of the notion that in fact the EMT program is an important route for cancer cells and normal epithelial cells to enter into the stem cell state. Implicit in what I'm saying are actually two things. First of all, there's great similarity in these processes between normal and neoplastic stem cells. And secondly, the changes I'm describing here to the, to the extent that they're important in the biology of normal cells and cancer cells have nothing to do with the genome because these are all epigenetic changes. And to the extent that one wants to understand the biology of cancer cells, sequencing the genomes of human cancer cells, which is all the rage these days, will tell one absolutely nothing. So, uh, <laughs> But this stays entre nous here. Okay, so, uh, so um, uh, Jing, uh, Wen Jun Guo asked the question, can one produce more compelling um, uh, experimental proofs that there's a connection between the EMT program and uh, the stem cell program? What he did was he took uh, mammary stromal fat pads, removed the uh, rudimentary epithelial cells there, implanted uh, mammary epithelial cells, and if they indeed contain mammary epithelial stem cells, they could generate a new, uh, incomplete mammary ductal tree, a stringent test of the stemness of the implanted cells. And uh, what he found, uh, to make a long story short, was that if one takes epithelial, mammary epithelial cells, a certain quantum of them, and puts them into a mammary stromal fat pad and waits six or eight weeks, they form a, a, a rudimentary structure like this. However, if one takes those cells, briefly exposes them to an EMT-inducing signal, and then implants them, they form mammary ductal trees like this, improving by a factor of 25 their ability to seed an entire adult organ, indicating very strongly the connection between the EMT program and the epithelial stem cell program. Here he increased the stemness of these cells by a factor of 100 by exposing them transiently to EMT-inducing uh, transcription factors and plotting out a very simple genetic path between bona fide stem cells and highly differentiated cells. This led in turn to another series of questions, but it, uh, perhaps for me the most interesting question was the following. I told you before that the formation of a, a primary tumor involves a whole succession of genetic changes. Is it the case that this final step involves the additional uh, accumulation of genetic changes, or might it be the case that the cells that, that have arrived at this stage in multi-step tumor genesis already genetically equipped to metastasize, needing only to activate their previously unexpressed or latent EMT program. And uh, in other words, are these carcinoma cells already genetically equipped to metastasize? And to do that, uh, Susanna Keshkushova and Yasmin de Koch did a series of experiments. They turned on the EMT uh, transcription factors in an otherwise benign set of tumor cells. The otherwise benign tumor cells 10 weeks later formed smooth boundaries, indicating a lack of invasiveness. The cells that at 10 weeks earlier experienced transiently the expression of EMT-inducing transcription factors were highly invasive. And perhaps most compelling is the metastatic behavior of these cancer cells. The cancer cells that had not experienced transiently uh, 10 weeks earlier the, EM the EMT formed very few metastases in the lungs. 
However, those that 10 weeks earlier had indeed formed lung metastases now formed uh, 400 micrometastases, small clusters, clusters of cancer cells in the lung, or uh, alternatively, macroscopic metastases far larger than these small clusters. And uh, I think uh, given the time, maybe I should. I have still a couple minutes. Oh, you scared me. OK, so uh, <laughs> just, just to finish up, um, I mean, I'm still in the business, but just for today. Uh, <laughs> Um, here's the cross-section of a mammary duct, the work of Chenier, and what she has studied is the fact that the, epith the mammary duct is a bilayered epithelium. Here's the lumen. Luminal cells on the inside and on the outside are basal cells, which are the known sites of uh, mammary epithelial stem cells. And the question is, if one induces now cancer in these uh, mammary epithelial cells, in this case in the mouse, uh, what will happen in terms of the formation of cancers, the normal stem cells, and uh, the cancer stem cells. Again, to repeat, the normal stem cells are known to reside out here. And these normal cells, stem cells express naturally the slug EMT-inducing transcription factor, indicating that the EMT program has a role in normal stemness. Here you see one manifestation of this in the work of Chenier, bilayered epithelium. Slug is expressed here on the outside. This is the location of the uh, of mammary stem cells. Here's a complication here, because on the outside, you see cells expressing other kinds of EMT-inducing transcription factors. These green cells on the outside, because this mammary duct, like the tumors I showed you earlier, is surrounded by a normal stroma. And the normal stroma is naturally composed of mesenchymal cells, and they actually express a whole series of EMT-inducing transcription factors. Here's yet another EMT-inducing transcription factor expressed by the stromal cells, the normal host tissue which complicates the analysis. Here, to make a long story short, are the results of Shinye's recent analysis of what happens when one actually induces carcinoma in a breast cancer prone um, transgenic mouse. And it's actually quite interesting, uh, at least for us. I mean, maybe not on the canvas of world history, but at least for us, it's interesting. Here we see the bilayered epithelium um, uh, that normally exists in, in a normal mammary gland. Slug is naturally expressed. This is an EMT-inducing transcription factor in normal basal cells. Luminal cells express none of these. If one starts the development of cancer, now one sees suddenly the appearance of the first cousin of slug, termed snail, which is turned on and turns on yet another EMT-inducing transcription factor, ZEB1. And I will tell you now that these, now, these cells are now cancer stem cells, which means that if they're extracted and implanted in a mouse, they can now generate new tumors. That has an interesting kind of uh, take-home lesson because it suggests that the cancer stem cells, which arise here, do not derive from the normal pre-existing normal mammary stem cells, which are in the other cell layer. In other words, cancer stem cells turn on their program uh, rather than uh, drawing from the pre-existing normal stem cell program. These cells up here turn out to be highly metastatic, the sources of uh, lung metastases. And after they, uh, after they disseminate to distant tissues, uh, the, the cancer stem cells then generate in the metastases a hierarchy which has a vague resemblance to what pre-existed in the normal tissue prior to metastatic dissemination. So we begin to realize now the dynamics of what governs normal epithelial stem cell physiology and how this program can be subverted by the cancer cells by activating, in this case, previously latent EMT-inducing transcription factors to drive their malignant progression. And now my time is definitively off. Unfortunately, unlike Gary, I don't have any close connections with the Berkeley Fire Department, which allowed him to gracefully, gracefully evade uh, a whole host of uh, scre screening questions of, 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 of heckling from uh, a critical audience. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So Bob would like some heckling. Usually when I'm here at uh, Berkeley, uh, I get heckling from Peter Duisberg, but he's actually not here, is he? <laughs> Sir. Are some of the environmental cues that trigger EMT mechanical yes. as well as chemical? Uh, it's not clear. It's clear that a lot of pro-inflammatory signals are uh, responsible, uh, released by inflammatory cells such as macrophages and myofibroblasts um, inactivating the EMT. But the, and those are, let's say, diffusible or paracrine and juxtacrine signals. The additional question is, is the stiffness of the extracellular matrix 
of which the uh, stroma is composed, is that also an important clue? And there seem to be indication that that also adds insult to injury. So there are multifactorial environmental or contextual signals that awaken the previously latent EMT program in, uh, in epithelial cells, and, and they may indeed uh, contribute to that as well. Indeed, I showed you several examples of these heterotypic signals going from the stroma to the epithelium, and there are likely to be other combinations of such signals that operate during cancer progression and, by the way, also in normal embryogenesis, where the EMT program is, plays a frequent role in the interconversion of different cell types during organogenesis. Uh, thank you. We, we would love to have another question. However, the physicists are going to pull the alarm again. If we do, they're sick of the biologists talking so much. Thank you to all of the speakers. Thank you.